All right, it happened. On March 20th, a federal district court granted a preliminary injunction striking down the majority of the portions in California's Unsafe Handgun Act. What does that mean? What's the history to all of this? And especially if you're not from California, what's going on here in the first place? That's what we're looking at here. My name is Tom Grieve, former state prosecutor, criminal defense attorney. Guys, let's get into it. So apparently handguns just going off when they're dropped and exploding and not being safe and firing. This was a big problem in California in the 90s and evidently really nowhere else. Because to my knowledge, California is the only state that passed a law like California's Unsafe Handgun Act, which went into effect in 1999. Now I'm going to briefly explain this in the most succinct and clear way that I possibly can. The gist to it is this. If you want to be able to purchase a firearm from a store, a retailer, in other words, a federal firearms licensed dealer, it has to be a handgun, which includes semi-automatic pistols as well as revolvers, from a roster, from an approved list. So they cannot sell any firearms that are not on this list. In order to get on the list, you basically have to send in your firearm as a manufacturer to a certified testing laboratory, whatever that means. And if you are in compliance with all the tests and conditions, then you get to go on the roster for a year and it can be renewed annually. In order to be on that list, you basically need to meet certain safe firing requirements, reliability requirements, as well as satisfy a drop safety requirement. So in other words, you drop it from a certain height at a certain angle, it doesn't go off. And then also, and this is going to turn out to be a big one, it has to have certain features as decided by the state of California. And that's going to become really big as we move through time. Again, this is starting in 1999. So again, if you meet all that, then you get to go on a roster and then FFLs are allowed to sell the firearms on that roster. As California would go on in 2007, they started to add these requirements such as the CLI or the chamber loaded indicator as well as the MDM or magazine disconnect mechanism. So CLI, loaded chamber indicator, pretty self-explanatory. How do you know if there's a, a bullet in the chamber? Check the CLI. So there should be you know some sort of red button or something sticking out, something like that. MDM magazine disconnect. In other words, if the magazine is out, you've disconnected uh, the firing mechanism so that you can no longer just pull the trigger. Uh, of course, this has to do with the fact that many newer firearms, largely starting with Glock, in order to disassemble, you actually had to pull the trigger, which apparently is evil. We got to do something about that. Or at least that's the way California felt. Up until 2007, there had been about 800 handguns, again, to include both semi-automatic as well as revolvers, added to the roster. 2007, the California legislature passes the loaded chamber indicator as well as the magazine disconnect. And then since then, only 32 have been added to the roster. So interestingly enough, the governor, if you know who I'm talking about, that's right, Arnie Arnold Schwarzenegger, back when he was governor of California, signed into law an interesting provision once upon a time that said that, look, if microstamping ever becomes technologically feasible and commercially viable, then look, California can add that as a requirement to get on the roster. Well, that day then came evidently in around 2013 when California decided, you know what, we're going to add this as well as the loaded chamber indicator and the magazine disconnect. Now all new handguns need to have micro stamping technology, which of course isn't a thing outside of a lab or something like that, because as a court's going to note, that is not commercially viable technology, let alone perhaps even technologically feasible. And it isn't the combination of the two, which would probably explain the fact of why since 2013, there have been exactly zero new handguns added to the California roster. That's going to be very important for the court ruling that we've got coming up. So I also just want to touch on the secondary market because again, the roster is really only impacting the primary market, at least directly. It of course impacts the secondary market, primary market being retailers, secondary market, what you can buy and sell off friends and strangers, that kind of stuff, not going through an FFL. So if you're moving to California, you can bring your firearms with you, you can bring your handguns with you. Those are basically fine. You could then sell those on the secondary market. Likewise, if you're police or if you occupy the correct positions in government, you do not have to comply with the roster and you can purchase whatever handgun you want. You know, law enforcement, if you work in a district attorney's office, basically, again, if you hold the appropriate positions of government, authority and power, then evidently unsafe handguns are no longer a concern. Feel free to buy as many as you'd like and flip them out the back door if you so chose, which I can imagine that a number of folks probably chose that given the fact that for a used secondary market handgun that was not roster compliant, we were seeing, according to testimony in this case, sometimes as much as a 300% markup to get that used 
Gen 4 Glock, as opposed to if you were to get it new in another state. So yeah, you're, you're paying absurd markups. But generally speaking, if you move to California from out of state, the handguns you bring with you are fine. Likewise, if you occupy the correct positions of government, law enforcement, certain district attorneys, and so on, then yes, you are absolutely allowed to purchase unsafe firearms on in the eyes of California because they're not on the roster. And then you could consequently move on and sell those in the secondary market. Again, what a nice markup that was. And I'm sure that did some nice funny for police departments. I'd also be curious to see how often police departments, if we have more turnover of firearms in California, because this could have been a revenue generation thing. Side tangent, but just kind of a thought as I'm doing this right now. So that's kind of the way that that all works, which if you think about it, leaves us in this absolutely preposterous position where California has by executive and, and legislative fiat decided that these features are what make a firearm safe. And as a result, all the firearms that meet that roster are now all old guns, which are, you know, intrinsically going to have been used more. There might be parts that are in disrepair, parts that have not been serviced. You're going to have more prone to cracking, failures, and all that other kind of stuff as compared to what are generally going to be newer, better condition, and therefore you know, more safe handguns that you could buy today. So California has created a situation where on paper, they're trying to at least claim, because we all know this really isn't what it's about, but on paper, they're trying to claim that, look, we want to promote firearm safety and we want to make sure there's no unsafe handguns. And they've created a situation where they have the exact opposite outcome where the firearms are gonna be probably take as a whole much less safe. But then in 2022, we had the New York Rifle State Pistol Association v. Bruin. This was the decision that basically set the framework for how all future Second Amendment battles are meant to be fought. And specifically among the many things that it did is it said, look, the first step in assessing whether a regulation or law violates the Second Amendment is to determine whether the plain text of the Second Amendment covers the conduct that's being regulated as part of the challenged law, which absolutely is what we have here. We're talking about people purchasing handguns, which Bruin also specifically said that handguns are a common use weapon, DC versus Heller term. And as a result, this is gonna be core constitutional amended protected activity. Which brings us to this lawsuit, Bolin v. Bonta, B-O-L-A-N-D v. Bonta, B-O-N-T-A. I apologize if I'm mispronouncing anything there. That is not my intention. Bolin sued basically saying, look, the UHA, this is not constitutional under the Bruin test. And of course, you can imagine that the California politicians and DOJ strongly disagrees, but the judge thankfully saw it another way and wound up ruling, and I'm just going to pull out a couple juicy quotes here, that the challenge UHA, the Unsafe Handgun Act, provisions unquestionably infringe on the right to keep and bear arms. The government's position, of course, is that, look, this is, this is fine. This is not unconstitutional. So this is the government's defense because people can still purchase some guns, and some guns are good enough for a right. You know, like some protection for some unreasonable searches and seizures is good enough. And some free speech is good enough. And some churches or temples being available to you is good enough rather than the one that you want to go to, right? The court went on to say, indeed, the Constitution protects much more than the bare right to keep and bear arms any outdated firearm for self-defense because the court observed the fact that the majority of Californians, their access to firearms, and especially this goes if they're not of basically the absolute top income classes who can afford to purchase things at, you know, 300% the price, that the majority of those folks are now left with firearms that at this point are almost two decades old and in many times much older than that. This is not what the Constitution's about. This is not what the Second Amendment's about. So I'm going to throw you some helpful quotes and I don't want to spend too much time going through all the different citations. So I'm just going to copy paste this paragraph into the description box. So be sure to check that out. The Second Amendment also protects the attendant rights that make the underlying right to keep and bear arms meaningful. This is what a court said when explaining that the right to possess firearms for protection implies a corresponding right to obtain the bullets necessary to use them because without bullets the right to keep and bear arms would be meaningless when we're talking about firearms likewise Another court in the Seventh Circuit back in 2011 commented while striking down a Chicago ordinance that barred firing ranges from operating within city limits. They stated that the right to possess firearms for protection implies a corresponding right to acquire and maintain proficiency in their use. The core right wouldn't mean much without the training and practice that make it effective. Another court in 2022 mentioned that reasoning that the right to keep and bear arms implies a corresponding right to manufacture arms because the right to keep and bear arms would be meaningless if no individual or entity could manufacture a firearm. All of it goes without saying that if you're left with old, crusty, perhaps dilapidated firearms that you had to pay a lot of money for, 
right. That's what we have here. And accordingly, the court granted an injunction which only stripped the roster of a couple of the components because the roster again came down to four things. You had the micro stamping, you had the chamber loaded indicator, you had the magazine detach mechanism, and then you also had the drop test, okay, and the safe firing requirements and so on. That's the original 1999 stuff. The court struck down the last, or pardon, the first three. So the loaded chamber indicator, the magazine disconnect, and the micro stamping. But it left in place, as part of granting the injunction, the original drop test, which would seem to therefore leave in place the original roster. The court also, by the way, because I know what you're asking, does that mean that if I live in California or if I've got a friend in California, they can just go out and buy something that, you know, maybe would be on the roster or whatever the case may be? The court very importantly said that, look, the effective date of this injunction is 14 days from the release date, which is March 20th. And that was specifically done to give the government time to appeal this, which on March 27th, they did apply for appeal to the Ninth Circuit Court. So we're gonna see this go up to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Invariably, we're gonna see this as well as many other Second Amendment cases that are currently working its way out of the Fifth and other circuits work its way up to the US Supreme Court. If you want us to stay on top of this and if you want more California coverage in general, let me know in the comment field below low because again i do a lot of adjusting of what kind of videos and what kind of content we create based on what you down the lens tell me you want to see so if you want to see us following this particular strain let me know if you are any other particular cases you want us following let me know as well as always it's been a pleasure seeing and having this conversation with you and by you i mean not only just you of course the camera but you on the other side of the screen and we will see you in the next one Thanks for sticking around to the end of the video. If you enjoyed this one, please feel free to check out some of our other great content and we'll see you in the next one.